I'm Joe Grasmick. I am vice chair of our upstate chapter of the American Immigration Lawyers Association and also a founder of the organization. And it's really nice to be doing this. Tax was one of my worst topics in law school. And look, I'm running a, a, a moderating a panel on it. What a great country. <laughs> but it's um, probably, I'm probably a good person to do that because uh, tax is, uh, you know, one of the cliches I've, I've heard for the 30 years I've practiced is um, immigration is second only to tax in terms of complexity. So today we've got the two of them together. <laughs> you know, and you'll hear judges say things like uh, the labyrinth of Minos and all, it's, it's just uh, really, really complicated stuff, but very important. Uh, the, um, I've done business immigration law, it's all I've done since I've, I've practiced law, and the questions I get the most that aren't immigration are tax and financial. Um, you know, how can we open a bank account without a social security number? Uh, can I get a mortgage? Uh, uh, can Canadians borrow money? Um, am I going to have to pay tax double in both countries? Yet all those kinds of questions. And what I would like to happen here today is instead of just saying, I don't know anything about tax, you know, and maybe refer, refer it out, say, I don't know anything about tax, but I see this possible issue that I'm spotting and, you know, take it a step further, maybe one or two lines of information because clients want more and more services, especially in these hard economic times. And the more you can do for the client, the happier you're going to, you know, they're going to be with you. And people really expect um, you know, their lawyers and their accountants to do a lot of stuff now. So I, that's the purpose of this, is to just amplify a little bit what we can do for each other. And it works the other way, too, because there's a lot of issue spotting that tax professionals can do in the immigration end. Uh, so the way, you know, the way it's structured today is, or this evening, is um, more or less in frequently asked questions, the ones that we hear the most and I'll kind of introduce each speaker and a question, and then they're going to kind of take it from there, from uh, frequently asked, asked questions. Um, the, if there's questions from the crowd, uh, one nice way would be to put them in writing and come around here. This is the video space, is just this podium, so you can come and leave the questions, preferably with the name of somebody that you'd like to answer the question. Uh, but I won't be Nazi about it. If somebody wants to uh, yell out a question, that's fine, but the speaker will need to repeat it because the microphones are just here in this area. So our, our three speakers tonight, Brent Susi, Jason Ubeka, and Penny Beckwith. Uh, since we, Brent is a hot commodity. Since we last print, since we printed our brochures that you have there, he's already changed jobs. Somebody else grabbed him. So, He's got new contact information. He's at TE Wealth, uh, no longer with uh, BDO Dunwoody. He provides cross-border financial planning, and he practices cross-border tax, and he does cross-border investment and retirement advisory work. There's a full bi bio uh, in your handout materials. Um, his contact information, his email is bsouci, B-S-O-U-C-I-E, at tewealth.com. So be Susie at tewealth.com if you want to write that down to supplement your handout materials. Uh, Jason Ubeka seems to be the, the go-to man uh, for cross-border tax questions at BDO Dunwoody in Mississauga, and I think even outside of Mississauga. Uh, these guys are great. Um, and then finally, Penny Beckwith, um, she is with uh, HSBC, and the information she's given me in different seminars we've we've been we've we've shared the podium in different seminars and it's just made a lot of my clients happy some of the things i've been able to um, tell tell the clients simple solutions for different things i look like a hero you know when i suggest a lockbox what's a lockbox you're going to find out and then afterwards you can ask her about the bicycle ride from toronto to niagara falls she just did <laughs> So we'll start out with, um, with Brent. Um, this question kind of came out of these semi uh, you know, seminars that, that we've done, Penny's done them. I know Dan Joyce um, has done some as well. Um, Mary Mocha, who actually ran them, um, 
their seminar is called NEBS for that the Canadian government and the Canadian consulate uh, did to uh, educate Canadian companies coming down to the United States in different aspects. Uh, one of the things I would always say is that uh, out, of, out of a room full of Canadians, one out of 20 always has some kind of claim to derivative U.S. citizenship <laughs> that you need to, fought, to ask about. You know, a, a parent that was born in the United States or, you know, derivative citizenship. And sure enough, when I, if I ask for a show of hands, it'll be one out of 20. If there's 40 people in the room, it'll be two. If there's 20, it'll be one. So this is the kind of question that comes up. You know, I, I would call Brent on the phone and I'd say, I just went through my derivative citizenship chart with a Canadian over the phone. And I told him he's been a dual citizen all his life. He's scared. He thinks he has to pay back taxes for all those years. What do I tell him? Thank you, Joe. And uh, you're absolutely right. Um, our country has a lot of U.S. citizens residing in it. Uh, Jason married one. Um, my neighbor is one. Um, our boss is one. Um, or my former boss, I should say. So I, I've heard reports and I've, I've read newspaper articles where they estimate, no one really knows for sure because you know a lot of these citizens don't know that they're citizens, but I've heard that there's upwards of a million uh, living in Canada and, and our total population is just over 30 million. So when, when Joe says one out of 20, it, it, it's, it is the truth uh, given what I've read and what I've heard. Um, now, what we would tell to someone who just found out they're a U.S. citizen? Uh, well, the, the first thing I would really do is uh, explain the concept of a foreign tax credit. Now, specifically for, for a U.S. citizen who resides in Canada. Now, if, for example, this was someone who was born in the United States and moved to Canada at a very young age, uh, presumably they've been living and working in Canada for a long time and filing income tax returns in Canada um, and paying income tax in Canada. Now, yes, as a citizen of the U.S., you are obligated to file an annual tax return. And yes, your worldwide income has to go on that tax return. But with a foreign tax credit, what you do is you pay tax in the country of source. So if you earn your income in Canada, you pay tax to Canada. And then you bring a credit over onto the United States return. Now, on, on most types of income, employment income, uh, unincorporated business income, the Canadian rates are higher than the U.S. rates, so the credit that you bring across completely offsets your U.S. liability. That would be the first thing I would, I would say to someone in that circumstance is you, you won't owe principally on, on your unreported income to the extent that you've already paid Canadian tax. Now, invariably, the next question that comes up is, well, you know, what, what do I do to get caught up? Do I just start filing returns now? And this is a bit more of a complicated issue, reason being um, there's different types of people out there. There's uh, people that the IRS considers to be high risk and there's people that the IRS considers to be low risk. Um, what, we, what we first describe is this, this new streamlined process for filing catch-up returns where the IRS basically says to people who are compliant in their country of residence but not compliant in the US um, is you can file three years worth of tax returns and six years of the FBAR form. The, the FBAR form is a disclosure form where you list all of your non-US financial assets. Um, the IRS offers this program to people who they consider to be low risk, uh, people who owe less than $1,500 of US tax per year, um, and people who, who don't present any, any sort of complicated, complicated tax planning or who don't illustrate any form of complicated tax structures. Now, the majority of our clients would fit into this particular um, fit, in, fit into this particular program offered by the IRS. Um, reason being, like I said, they pay tax in Canada. Maybe they're retired in Canada. They don't owe anything to the IRS. Three years of returns, six years of FBAR forms. There's a there's a streamlined center where the IRS is accepting these these packages, uh, and off we go. We we file that, and you're caught up. You're compliant, and you just have your ongoing filing obligation. So that's number one. What I tell to Canadian residents. Now, there are those out there who, who either don't qualify for the new streamlined procedure or who present high compliance risk. Um, there are other programs out there. I'm sure most of you have heard of the Offshore Voluntary Disclosure Initiative. Um, it was all over the news in Canada um, for, for people uh, who are looking to get caught up in compliant. Now, the, I'll call it the OVDI, but the OVDI is not for everyone. 
I don't want to generalize. Whether or not you're a suitable candidate for the OVDI depends on your, your facts and circumstances, but typically it is for people who are not compliant in the U.S., period. They're not compliant anywhere. They, they have significant exposure in terms of, you know, back taxes or, or, or penalties for unfiled forms or penalties for unpaid tax. That would be a suitable OVDI candidate. Um, you know, your, your retiree who's living in Canada who's filed Canadian returns their whole life, probably not for them. The OVDI requires um, eight years of tax returns, uh, eight years of FBAR forms. Uh, you have to hire a tax lawyer to walk you through the process. And uh, it, it's a really big and cumbersome sort of process getting yourself compliant through the OVDI. Now, if, you, if you're not really a, a, an audit target or a, you know, someone who's going to owe the IRS a lot of money, the OVDI is probably not for you. Um, I've heard that tax lawyers, uh, which Jason and I are not, have quoted people uh, $25,000 minimum uh, just to walk you through the legal steps inherent in the process. Forget about uh, the fees that you know BDO or TE Wealth would charge in preparing your returns. Uh, so it could be a pretty, pretty costly exercise. It uh, it actually brings a joke to mind uh, where you have a, a room with a high-priced accountant, a low-priced accountant, the tooth fairy, and they're sitting at a table, and there's a piece of cake in the middle of the table. The lights go off, the lights come back on, and the piece of cake is gone. Who ate the cake? Tooth fairy. The high-priced accountant, because the low-priced accountant and the tooth fairy are pigments of your imagination. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> at your next event, you can replace the word accountant with lawyer if you, if you really want to. But um, no, the OVDI just the, the point is it's expensive. Uh, it's for people who have significant risk, maybe even criminal exposure. When you file through it, you're agreeing to certain levels of penalties, even though they are reduced. Um, but you're, the IRS is agreeing not to sort of prosecute you criminally. Um, that's not the avenue that most of our clients end up filing. So that's what I, that's what I tell someone who finds out they're a citizen um, who, who's been residing in Canada. Now, the, the same sort of problem exists for green card holders. Uh, green card holders um, have the same filing obligation that citizens do. They have to file U.S. income tax returns on an annual basis, and on those income tax returns, you report worldwide income. Now, the same logic applies in terms of foreign tax credits. If, you've, if you have a green card holder who's a Canadian resident, um, you pay your tax in Canada, you can bring it across as a credit. Um, the only additional question that kind of comes up with respect to green card holders is, well, you know, I, I've heard that as a green card holder, I'm not a citizen, I, I can file as a non-resident of the United States. And I, I, I don't agree with that position, but I'll tell you where I think it comes from. Now, the tax treaty between Canada and the United States has a series of tiebreakers. Um, if you are a resident of Canada by virtue of your factual ties to Canada, and a resident of the United States by virtue of the substantial presence test, in other words, your, your, your days that you spend in the U.S., um, you will be in this spot where you're a resident of both countries under each country's respective domestic tax law. And what the treaty does is the treaty steps in and tie breaks you, one direction or the other. So they have a hierarchy of rules. The first tiebreaker is where do you have a permanent home? If you have a permanent home in both countries, the next tiebreaker is where do you have more social and economic ties? Again, if that's, if, you know, if that's a standoff, you move on and on down the list. Now, what green card holders say is, um, can I use the treaty tiebreakers? And the reason green card holders feel they're, they're eligible for this and citizens are not is the treaty also contains a savings clause. And the savings clause at the end says, you know, notwithstanding anything else that's written in this treaty, the U.S. reserves the right to tax its own citizens. It doesn't say its own green card holders. It says its own citizens. That's where I think this position comes from. Um, we certainly don't take that position. Uh, we file all of our green card holders as residents, as do our competitors. So um, what I would tell my clients or what I would tell your clients is, as a green card holder, you're, you're filing as a resident. Now, what would happen if you file a non-resident return? Well, it, it could be an indication to the IRS, at least, that you're, you're no longer a lawful permanent resident of the United States. And would that mean you have to hand your green card back? That's the risk you present. And as I say, um, we file green card holders as residents of the United States, um, as do the majority of our competitors. So that's 1040 a, NR is an NO. That's correct. Your green card holder. Okay. 1040 NR is an NO for green card holders. Yes. Um, 
you know, an, another question that often comes up is, well, okay, you know, I, I have my green card, and the reason why is I zip down to Buffalo for two days a week uh, for my business. I, I actually have a, a, a client and a friend who, who are in that exact same, uh, that exact same circumstance. They come down, um, they import to Canada, and then they go home. Um, they need the green card, green card just for sort of simplicity in, in getting across the border. Now, you know, the question that comes up, well, you know, I have my green card, okay, I agree, I'll do the U.S. tax return, but how do I work this for my business? How does my, how does my business file um, so that it's compliant not only Canada but in the U.S.? Because I'm no doubt working in the U.S. and I'm working through my business. Well, there's no, there's no easy answer I could give in, in a few minute presentation, but the first thing I would do is collect facts. Uh, not only about, you know, the number of days and the amount of income and what you do, that kind of stuff, um, but also uh, about the type of entity that the business is organized through, whether it's a corporation, uh, whether it's uh, an unincorporated proprietorship, um, you know, there, there may be S-Corps, LLCs, that kind of stuff in, in, a, in an org chart. Um, we need those facts in order to not only talk to you about your, your compliance obligations, but also about planning. Um, one thing that comes up all the time is, is LLCs. Um, unfortunately, Canada does not view them the same way the U.S. does. I'm talking about U.S. LLCs. They're pretty popular down here because they get you out of the U.S. corporate income tax rates. All of the income earned in the LLC flows through and is taxed in the hands of the individual at you know what's usually nicer rates. Um, Canada doesn't view them that way. Canada views them as corporations. So the income will not flow through the individual. They will re it will be taxed in the hands of the corporation, and uh, the individual will pay tax uh, to the extent and, and you know, to the timing of when their dividends or distributions pulled out. Now, this causes a problem because what you could have is a misalignment of your foreign tax credits. In other words, you could pay U.S. tax one year and the income inclusion doesn't happen on your Canadian tax return until a subsequent year. Now, there's no carry forward of foreign tax credits in Canada. Um, so what you could end up with is, is a double hit. Um, I, I unfortunately saw this happen to, uh, to a former client. Uh, it's a Canadian. Uh, they were investing in a movie production, and the movie production was being run through a U.S. LLC. They were, you know, one of many partners. Um, the movie was very successful. It's, it's one that we've all seen. Um, there was a hit on the U.S. side, and in a subsequent year when a distribution was pulled out, there was a hit on the Canadian side. Uh, so unfortunately, this, this former client... Um, Got, got the double hit and there wasn't much we could do to, to help them. Um, that's the risk with these LLCs. That's why the first step I would take when someone is doing business or conducting business in the, in the United States is to collect facts. Uh, not only about what they're doing, because you, you, you need to know that in order to know which treaty articles you're dealing with and such, but also the, the structure, so you know the obligations, the risks, um, you know, and, and the planning opportunities. Um, so the idea is do that so they don't get taxed twice? Yeah, what you want is an alignment of the income so the foreign tax credits wipe each other out, offset each other. This was a misalignment across different years. So they paid double. Almost double, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Is there a question? So, you know, a, another thing that, that kind of comes up is when, when companies in Canada are sending employees to the U.S. or vice versa, we get all kinds of questions about what your compliance obligations are, you know, what payroll can I remain on. Um, the short answer is whether you're an American working in Canada for an American company or a Canadian working in the U.S. for a Canadian company, you can get paid um, from whichever payroll you like. You know, if, 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 you're, if your living expenses are going to be uh, in Canada and you plan to retire in Canada, you might want to keep getting paid in Canadian dollars or vice versa. Um, you might want to keep getting paid in US dollars because it's your, you know, it's your eventual, it's your eventual plan to return to the United States. That's all fine. That's all good. That can happen. But what you, what you can't forget is the minute you send someone across the border, you have compliance and filing obligations. For example, if you send an employee from Buffalo to work in Toronto and that employee wants to stay on a US payroll, just one work day in Canada, whether it be by a resident, such as myself or Jason, or by a non-resident, you have to withhold Canadian income tax as an employer. Now, the treaty comes into play and you can, you know, you can get some of that back if, if you meet certain exemptions in the treaty and, and, 
and you can claim refunds on tax returns, but the obligation to withhold is there, and it's there as of day one. So the, the message for people kind of crossing the border for business or crossing the border even for employment is uh, you have obligations, tell us your facts, we can, we can certainly iron them out for you and, and, and have you avoid sort of problems uh, like, like my movie friend did or former client did. Um, that's, uh, that's all I was going to go over. Um, as Joe said, I, I started a new job uh, this week, uh, worked with Jason until Friday, now we're just friends. Um, <laughs> but uh, my contact details, what I can do is, uh, if you like, you can come up to me, I can write them down for you, or give me your business card, I'll email them to you tomorrow. Um, I don't have business cards yet, they couldn't churn them out in time for me to bring them down, but uh, the company's called TE Wealth, and, uh, and thank you very much for, for, for listening, and uh, it's a pleasure to be in Buffalo, I appreciate the invitation. I, I cheer for the Bills, does that help <laughs> my <laughs> stance? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so I, I have to repeat the questions for the, so the question was, yep. why do I cheer for the Bills? <laughs> um, and I have hockey connections, and I, I, I play men's league with, with Rob Ray, I coach against Matthew Barnaby, I, I got a lot of hockey contacts here in the city too, so I enjoy, I enjoy coming, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, there's a new question. Well, I, I've always I've always heard the question, you know, over the years. Um, you know, my my mother was born in the United States. Am I a U.S. citizen? And it's usually been people who want to be U.S. citizens. There's been a dramatic change. Um, most of the, re the the requests I get in that area now are I want to renounce my U.S. citizenship. Um, tax being, you know, tax considerations being part of it. I think the reason is that the Canadian long-term unemployment rate is half of the rate in the United States, so you're not getting those push-pull factors for people to see the benefits of, of uh, U.S. citizenship. Um, and also there's more tax uh, compliance crackdowns. But that's a very common question now. and. It, I'd phrase it like this to get uh, Jason started. My client wants to renounce U.S. citizenship. Says filing a U.S. tax return each year is a hassle. What will happen if he does it? What are the tax ramifications of renouncing his or her U.S. citizenship? Thanks, Joe. That is definitely indeed a very, very common question that we see nowadays, uh, more, more so than ever. There are um, dozens and dozens, hundreds of U.S. citizens coming out of the woodwork recently. Once we explain to them what's involved with their filing requirements as a, being a U.S. citizen, that they have to work, report the worldwide income to the U.S., uh, they understand it's an annual filing, they understand the cost. One of the first follow-up questions is, how do I get out of this? This is just way too onerous. What if I just give up my U.S. citizenship and what will happen? Um, in, in the longer run, uh, absolutely, you're, you're going to get rid of those U.S. filing requirements, but it may not be quite that simple. Uh, the, the U.S. in many cases is going to take one final shot at you. The IRS will want to grab any bit of tax that it legitimately can before it lets you truly expatriate for tax purposes. So in big picture sense, what does happen when someone expatriates? Well, there's Starting in 2008, there's what's called an exit tax. An exit tax means that immediately prior to expatriation, it's as if you sold all of the assets that you hold immediately prior to expatriation. So what would that mean? Well, what that would mean is if you have investments, you have stocks, you have real estate, you have retirement accounts, where the fair market value of these accounts is substantially more than what the original cost was, then you may have some capital gains or other forms of income that are going to be reportable on that final U.S. tax return that you file in the year of expatriation. And first thing that people ask when they hear that is, oh my goodness, that's going to be a huge number. How can I get out of this? Good news is that there are exceptions <coughs> to these rules applying. Um, first of all, you have to figure out whether they do apply, and that's going to involve filing Form 8854 with the IRS with your final tax return. Form 8854, why do I mention that? Well, if you don't file it, there's a penalty. The IRS is very fond of their $10,000 penalties for failure to file information returns, and the 8854 is certainly one of those. So that's 
That's the first pitfall that you have to make sure that you avoid. Um, now, when you, when you file the 8854, they're going to ask a lot of questions. There's uh, certain basic thresholds below which you're not going to have to actually pay the expatriation tax. Uh, one would be your average income level would have to be below a certain threshold per year. For 2012, it was 151000 uh, Your net worth would need to be below $2 million. And you have to have filed your, your 1040 for at least the five years prior to expatriation, which for a U.S. citizen living in Canada who hasn't been filing, that might be an obstacle in and of itself. Um, now, those, those exceptions are all, all fine and well, but what if we have someone who's um, uh, lived in Canada their, their whole life? They were born and raised in Canada. They just happened to have a U.S. parent, and that made them a U.S. citizen. They've built a successful business over the years. It's worth, let's say, $10 million nominal cost. Are they in trouble? Well, not necessarily, because there's another possible exception. That exception would be is if they were a dual citizen at birth and they didn't live in the U.S. for at least 10 out of the 15 years prior to expatriation. That's also an out from this exit tax. Um, if they have kids who are renouncing prior to age 18 and a half, that's another out. Now, let's say we have someone who, despite all these exceptions, is still going to be caught by exit tax. What does that really mean? What actually is taxable? Well, like I said, there is the excess of the fair market value over the cost of any investments that you hold. Could be investment portfolio, could be real estate. Uh, the good news, there is a bit of a savings clause here. Unless all of those aggregate gains and losses are more than a certain threshold, in 2012 that was 680000 then there won't be exit tax on that. So that's great. That might save another few people. But what about retirement accounts? Retirement accounts are a little bit different. In many cases, the entire value of that retirement account is going to be included in income on your, on your tax return. There are certain types of accounts that are protected. Um, a 401k, for example, would be what they call an eligible compensation plan, eligible deferred compensation plan. That won't be immediately included in income. But an IRA will, and so will a lot of other tax-sheltered accounts, such as uh, uh, qualified tuition programs, the Coverdell education savings plans, those get caught. And if they have any Canadian retirement plans, there's registered retirement savings plans are very common in Canada. They're akin to a 401k. Practically everyone in Canada has them. That's not an exception. So the entire value of your, your RRSP could be included in your income in the year of expatriation. And a lot of people have not just uh, tens of thousands, they can have hundreds of thousands. So putting that income on your final tax return, that could be quite costly. Um, you really need to compare what's the cost of doing my ongoing U.S. filings to the cost of any potential exit tax that might result if I was to expatriate. Um, now, and, and, and another kicker is that even if you do have a tax-deferred account, such as a 401k, uh, yes, there's no immediate tax, but when you do take out the distributions, you're looking at 30% withholding tax. If the withholding tax would have normally been less, you actually have to uh, sign a statement. You concede your right to the lower uh, withholding tax rate, and you are stuck with 30%. So there's an extra cost there as well. So there's, there's some pitfalls in how to avoid them. Um, a lot of people ask us, and ask our uh, lawyer colleagues, what are some preventable tax mistakes? How can I avoid them? How can I save my clients some money? Well, if they're expatriating, uh, you, you better gosh darn well make sure that you check to see if this exit tax is going to ap apply before you expatriate. And uh, I should point out that this isn't just for citizens. This is also for long-term green card holders. It applies just as equally to them. If you hold a green card, for at least eight out of 15, uh, 15 years prior to expatriation, you're going to be subject to these exact same rules. So a lot of, in a lot of cases, if you've been holding on to that green card in, with the thought, yeah, maybe I'm going to move down to the States again, start working again, well, if you're coming up towards that eight-year threshold, better really strongly consider it because you might be you might be incurring some extra tax by holding on to that green card for just that extra little year. Um, 
Other preventable tax mistakes, other ways to save money. Uh, we've been talking about people who are giving up their U.S. status. What about people who are Canadians? They're moving down to the States. They're going down there to work. And let's say that they're not just going on a temporary assignment. Um, let's say that they're actually moving to the States. They're going to become U.S. residents outright for tax purposes. What sort of stuff do they need to worry about? Well, one thing would be Canadian exit tax. Canada has an exit tax and always has. It's not a new thing up in Canada. When you leave Canada, it's as if you sold all the assets immediately before you left. You, could, you can post security as you can in the U.S. as well if the tax would be high. But that could, be, uh, that could be a significant barrier, and if you weren't expecting that sort of tax liability, you may not have the, the cash to fund it. Uh, another thing to watch out for, <clears throat> sorry, if someone goes down to the States, they, they terminate their Canadian residency for tax purposes, but let's say they still have some real estate up in Canada. What happens if they sell that property after they move down to the States? Well, now because you're a non-resident of Canada, you're selling Canadian real estate, there's going to be withholding tax consequences. You're going to still have to file an income tax return as well to report that sale of the property. And the, the default withholding tax is 25% of not the gain on sale of this property, it's 25% of the gross proceeds. So this is a, a non-trivial number. There are ways to file a clearance certificate to get out of that, but again, a nasty surprise that uh, clients would appreciate a word in advance about. Um, another tip, I, I'd mentioned in that Canadians have a lot of um, registered retired savings plans, RRSPs. Uh, an RRSP, if, if someone withdraws it while they're still a resident of Canada, it's taxed at normal Canadian tax rates. Right now that's in the mid to high 40% range if you're in top tax brackets. But once you're no longer a resident of US, there's just a flat 25% withholding tax rate. So someone who just waits maybe a few months before they pull the money out of the plan, they could be saving 20% tax on that withdrawal and again they would often appreciate a heads up on that um, last last thing I'd like to uh, point out as a possible way to help out your clients preventable tax mistakes uh, when they do move down to the states uh, just watch out for those Canadian financial connections that you keep because of course once you're in the US anything that's non US is outside of the box it's foreign requires foreign reporting is taxed in unfavorable ways. A lot of uh, Canadian financial connections that are quite innocuous, very routine, uh, maybe don't even require Canadian tax reporting at all. Uh, a great example is uh, something that they started up in 2009, tax-free savings accounts. Uh, you put the money into the account, comes out tax-free, and uh, all is good in Canada. U.S. doesn't recognize those accounts. It's going to tax you on the income in the account, and as well, in many cases, it's going to look at that TFSA and say, hey, you've got a foreign trust. You need to file Form 3520. You need to file Form 3528. And the cost of your tax compliance mounts as well as the actual tax liability. Um, in a lot of cases, you want to cut those ties before you leave. Uh, oh, sorry. Want, she wants to stick in a question. <laughs> okay. You need, you need to repeat it. Um, Absolutely. I'm just curious. Um, in the event that you know in advance you've got enough lead time that someone's considering these things, mm -hmm. does it make sense to move your investments offshore? Does that help in any respect for either Canadian or American to actually move it right <coughs> offshore? Usually no, because Can both... Can repeat the question? Oh, sorry. Uh, the question is, does it make sense to, if you're moving from Canada to the U.S., to move uh, your investments <coughs> offshore before the move? Uh, the answer would generally be no, because both Canada and the U.S. are not going to like the fact that you've got, you've got funds offshore. They're going to tax that generally in a punitive way. Uh, a lot of information disclosure, and it's, it's generally not recommended. The, the simpler the better, usually, is, is, the, is the case when you're talking about your investments, uh, keeping things to just run-of-the-mill stocks, bonds, guaranteed interest certificates, things of that nature will tend to result in the best tax consequences. By trying to move something offshore, more often than not, you're going to create more problems than you're solving. Thank you. Okay. Um, another question that we often see, and we're moving to a little bit different vein, we've been talking about citizens green card holders, um, how about visa holders? And um, 
many of you are immigration lawyers out there and you know all the ins and outs of um, for legal purposes when is it best to have this type of visa when is it best to have that type of visa but what about for tax purposes does it matter um, sometimes you might have a client come to you and say that uh, I really don't want to get a T1 uh, TN visa because I don't want to be taxable in both US and Canada when I as a Canadian I'm going down to work in the US um, the, the answer to that question is your visa status is not really relevant to the taxation. Taxation is going to be based on U.S. and Canadian tax rules and the tax treaty between U.S. and Canada. It's, it's really a question of where, where are you spending your time, where, where are you physically working, whether you have a TN visa or you have no visa at all. It's not really going to drive your tax treatment other than filling out a box on your tax return to say what type of visa you have. Um, under the tax treaty, if, if a Canadian is working in the U.S. and they make less than $10,000, they're not going to be taxable. That's what they, have, what's they, what they would call the de minimis test in Article 15 of the tax treaty. Now, if you're over $10,000, you have to look at it a little bit closer. You're still taxable, but only if your salary is being paid by a U.S. company or paid by a Canadian company that has a taxable presence in the U.S. Uh, another thing that would make it taxable would be if you as an employee are spending more than 183 days in the U.S., not in a calendar year, but in a rolling 12-month period. So it really is a moving target that you're talking about. Um, now that's for employees. If you're an independent contractor, different set of rules. It's, um, the concept is a permanent establishment. If as an independent contractor you have a permanent establishment in the U.S., then you're going to be taxable there. So an independent contractor is not likely to have a bricks and mortar office in the U.S., but they may very well be concluding contracts habitually in the U.S. That's something that could create permanent establishment. They also may trip a similar 183-day test to the individuals. If they're spending over 183 days in the U.S. and at least half of their income for the year for their business comes from those services rendered in the U.S., they're going to be taxable. That's, uh, that's a new change in the treaty that just came into effect in 2010. So a lot of people who used to be perfectly fine working 300 days in the U.S. and not being taxable, they're all of a sudden getting caught now, and a lot of that is catching them off guard. So still on the topic of visas, in general, does it make a difference what type of visa I get? If we're talking a, a standard work visa, whether it's a TN, an H-1B, L-1 visa, it doesn't really have an impact on the taxation. Uh, really the only place where the type of visa becomes relevant are special status sort of people, uh, students who are on the, I believe, J visa, Q visa. They, they do get special treatment, as do teachers who are also on those types of visas. They can outright <coughs> exclude days that they spend in the U.S. for the purposes of determining their U.S. residency. Um, another example would be governmental workers uh, who might be on a, a A visa, might be on a G visa. They also enjoy those sorts of benefits. They have to do some paper pushing to get those benefits, but they are there. So if someone <coughs> qualifies for that type of visa, that's usually the way to go. It, it keeps the tax compliance a lot simpler. Um, another, now we've been really focusing more on the perspective of the employee. Sometimes you might get questions from not the employee, but the, the employer who have concerns about applying for particular types of visas and what the implications are. So you might have um, the employee's employer say, I'm really a little hesitant to apply for this L1 visa because I'm concerned that this is going to imply that my business is conducting business in the U.S. and I'm worried about the, the Canadian tax impact to my corporation of that status. Uh, now what would they be getting at really here is that in most cases they'd be concerned about losing what's called the small business deduction in Canada. Um, for a privately controlled business in Canada, most of them qualify for this. It makes a big difference in the tax rate. For the first $500,000 of corporate income tax rate right now is only 15.5% as opposed to more like 25% if they don't qualify for the status. So if you do the math, that's, that, that could be $50,000 or so of tax savings per year. So 
the, the, the accountants in Canada are not going to want to do anything that's going to jeopardize that. Um, I would suggest that if, if the activities of the employer are going to be problematic, it's going to be problematic whether they're down in the U.S. without a visa at all or whether they're down on an L-1. Um, what's really going to be relevant is, um, and it, it's, it's a subjective test, and it's best to talk to um, Canadian tax accountant who specializes in corporate matters and international matters to get a real good handle on it. But generally speaking, if you've got a, um, if you've got a business that's uh, a Canadian business that's quote unquote doing business in the US, that means that transactions for the sale of goods are habitually going to be conducted in the US. If you just have very, very occasionally someone going down to the US to do a few sales, that's probably not going to jeopardize your whole, com uh, your whole company's status. But if you have a whole herd of people going down and part of the regular territory is upstate New York, then yeah, that, that means it's a higher likelihood that the whole company is going to be tripped up by this sort of thing. If it's sale of services, what's relevant is where are those services being rendered. But uh, the bottom line is that for immigration purposes, doing business in the U.S. is quite different from what it would be from a Canadian tax perspective. Certainly not synonymous. Uh, that's, that's really all I wanted to cover as far as the, the standard questions that we, we, think, um, we think lawyers may, may face and encounter in their client base that relate to the, uh, uh, the tax accounting side of things. So I'd like to thank you for inviting me here. And uh, it, we at BDO, it, in the Mississauga office in the Greater Toronto area, we have uh, quite a strong group that provides cross-border tax mm -hmm. services. Our, our U.S. tax group for this coming tax season is going to be around 35 people. Um, quite a few of them, like me, specialize in cross-border tax for individuals, but also uh, roughly the same number of us specialize in cross-border taxes for businesses. So we really have all angles covered and we have the critical mass to be able to handle all of the, the needs for Canadian businesses moving down into the U.S. or exploring doing that. Yeah, Jason has a good point. Sometimes it's not just a matter of getting a U.S. accountant and a Canadian accountant in the room. There's yet this third specialty. It's the people who work in this Canada-U.S. interface, and it's almost like a different animal. Uh, so keep these guys on your Rolodex. Uh, now a little uh, uh, housekeeping. Uh, this is going to be videoed for CLE credit, and so one of the um, things we need to do is give a code word uh, for the people watching that they'll need to write down to get their CLE credit. And that code word is prosperity. Prosperity. So what gave me the idea of inviting uh, Penny was an article I was reading in the Wall Street Journal a while back. And I'll just read you an excerpt from this article. Uh, the, the title was Immigration Policy Details Emerge. The Obama administration on Friday revealed details of its sweeping immigration program that could allow almost one million undocumented young people to remain in the country. The process, which does not offer a path to citizenship, opens on August 15th. And then they had a picture of a, a clean-cut young man, and the caption is, An Angel Angel Silva, an undocumented student in Los Angeles, says the immigration rules will help him get a house. That is one of the most common questions I get. Can I get a mortgage? If, I, if I'm coming in a TN, can I get a, mor can I get a mortgage in the U.S.? especially when Canadians hear that we can write off our mortgage insurance because they can't do that. Um, so that is the question that I have, and it was just accentuated. I was um, in an interview with a, um, not your bank, but somebody in another bank, and uh, we were trying to get a mortgage. My girlfriend's buying half my house, selling hers, and I gave her my business card, and she says, oh, you do Canadian immigration, and, and it, she says, we don't give mortgages to Canadians. And I'm going, okay, that's interesting. So that's my question um, to, to start out with Penny. Can Canadians get a mortgage with your bank? And if so, how? <laughs> so, I, so the answer is yes. The answer is yes. Um, uh, 
within this cross-border um, you know, banking group, although we focus primarily on the corporate needs of our clients, obviously the, you know, the people that are representing the companies are individuals, right? So the, it's always an issue. I've made money here in the U.S. I want to buy a house you know, in, uh, you know, in Florida and Arizona. Um, especially recently, we feel like because of the strength of the Canadian dollar, um, you know, some of the, the tax issues that were changing um, as of the end of the year, people wanting to sell businesses, sell properties before the end of, the, end of uh, 2012, uh, we felt like the, the, the U.S. was on sale, right? Um, there was a lot of, lot of uh, acquisitions of not only companies but properties. And, um, and yes, you know, Canadian individuals and uh, Canadian companies uh, can be financed in, in the U.S. Um, on the individual side, um, some banks will require uh, a Social Security number. Um, not all banks do. Um, Social Security, you know, number runs with, obviously, whether you're earning income in the, in the U.S. Um, some, some of our cross-border banks will require a Social Security number in order to apply for a mortgage. Um, in, the, in our case, we do not require a, a Social Security number. In fact, if you're, a, um, if you're a client of HSBC in Canada, um, if you're um, um, you know, part of our uh, premier banking, our private banking service, they have really great expat um, fin financing available. Um, where your financing can be based here in the U.S., based upon U.S. rates mm -hmm. for U.S. properties. So, so the answer is yes. yes. <laughs> is yes. And you can use the credit, um, the credit history in Canada? Yes, it okay. is transferable. That's, that's the beauty of that ex expat pro um, program. Um, and that works for U.S. Um, uh, U.S. individuals that are also, you know, moving to overseas locations. Your credit history sort of transfers with you in that, with that expat service. Um, uh, our group um, has been based out of Buffalo for, I don't know, when I think back to Leal Nobach or um, those of you who have been around for a while, um, you know, Jack Schreiber, you know, probably 30, 35 years at least. And the reason that we're here on the border is that, you know, we spend all of our time calling on Canadian companies but just um, financing their U.S. their U.S. businesses. and. Um, if, I, if this was a room of Canadian individuals, I would ask the question, how many of you have a U.S. bank account based in Canada? And you would see all of the hands go up, right? Because in Canada, you can have an account that's based in U.S. dollars that you can write checks off of, and it settles every day um, in U.S. dollars. But you can't have that here. You can't have the same thing here in Canadian dollars. And, um, you know, the very basic question for folks is, why do I need a relationship with a, with a U.S. bank? Why is that important? I can, I, you know, I, ha I have a checking account, I have a credit relationship in Canada. Why do I need one here in the States? Um, and, and the answer is, as much as we like to think we're alike, we're so close, right? You know, when the, when the Canadian dollar or the U.S. dollar was stronger, you know, you, we would spend more nights in, uh, Ni in Niagara on the Lake going to dinner than we would, you know, in downtown Buffalo. Um, we, when it comes to banking, we're really quite different. Um, we really sort of operate on on two different systems, and in many cases, those systems don't um, interconnect um, with in, in an efficient manner to be able to serve business needs. Um, so even though a company or an individual may have an account in Canada. If, for example, a company is collecting um, checks, if they're co collecting receivables from their U.S. Uh, from their U.S. Uh, clients, and they're taking them up to Canada and they're depositing them in their U.S. dollar accounts in Canada, those checks, although they will appear to have, have, uh, you know, although they appear to be given full credit for those checks within those accounts, behind the scenes, those checks could be clearing for weeks. Um, you know, a, a Canadian uh, company or a Canadian individual might find that a U.S. check that they've deposited into that account has, has um, bounced weeks, sometimes, you know, three, four, five weeks after the, uh, the item has been deposited, much, much longer than it would here in the States. And it's just because our systems are separate, right? They operate quite, different, quite differently. 
Um, so, you know, when people say, why do, why, why do I even need an account? Why have, I have a, a U.S. dollar account. It's really because um, our systems are quite different and, um, you know, they work sometimes more efficiently within themselves. Um, the other re very common reason that people open up accounts in the U.S. with U.S. banks is to facilitate payroll. Um, you know, payroll providers, first of all, payroll is complex in the U.S. You know, we don't ever recommend a, a Canadian company take that on themselves. Um, you know, that we, we suggest always that they work with someone, a professional here, to, to handle uh, payroll of their U.S. employees. And payroll here is electronic, right? I mean, we all use ACH services here in the States. In Canada, they have an EFT product, which is very similar, but they're not cross-border in nature. So you, Canadian companies cannot use that U.S. dollar account um, in Canada to process payroll here in the U.S. They have to have a U.S. account, which is actually domiciled in the U.S. for payroll to, um, um, to happen. Um, payroll companies, you know, want to be able to debit account, uh, an account here. Um, one of the, you know, when you look at the differences in banking, the, the obvious is um, just the number of banks. Um, you know, in Canada you have the big five, right? And then you have another layer of some foreign banks like ourselves. Um, and then there's a, there's a number of, um, you know, regional uh, credit unions. Um, but really, pull them all together and you're well on, you're still under 75, 100, right? You know, at last count in the United States, we have over 8,000 banks. And, you know, of every shape and size, focusing on different, on different things. Um, if, I have, if I have four competitors, I may act quite differently than I do if I have 7,999 competitors, right? My pencil has to be a bit sharper. Or I need to know where, where I'm focused in terms of um, my business, what, you know, um, what what services I can provide and what market segment I'm going to um, I'm going to focus on um, because of we have so many um, banks here in the U.S. Our services, our products and services, tend to be um, uh, they tend to lag behind the Canadians in terms of technology. Um, you know, it's a bit easier to manage when you only have five major banks that um, you know. Checks in Canada clear overnight, right? You deposit a check today, it's available tomorrow. You know, here it's still, you know, probably two to three days on average for a check, depending upon where it's drawn and, you know, the dollar amount and what bank it's been drawn on and what region. You know, we're still in the two to three day range, even with clearing of electronic files. Um, you know, Canadian companies oftentimes don't realize that. Um, you know, I have a list of overdrawn clients every morning that I have to address mm -hmm. who have deposited checks and are, you know, writing checks on, on uh, items that have not yet cleared. Um, the importance of a branch in Canada is quite different than here in the United States. Um, banks tend to really focus on what branch you do business on in Canada. You know, I deal, you know, you have to deal with not only a brand, but a specific physical location. Um, uh, in fact, it is not uncommon for even some of the largest companies in Canada for someone to, to take a check run to the branch every day and deposit, physically deposit checks, where in the States, um, electronic services have really done away with that between uh, the very common use of a lockbox, as we had talked about, which is really a P.O. box that we all write our, you know, pay bills to. Uh, a lockbox is a, is, a, um, is a P.O. box which is manned by a bank. Uh, banks go in every day, we, they clean out those items, they take them to the bank on behalf of the customer, and they deposit them and they image the items that they have deposited back, back to that client. Um, much, much more common in the U.S. than in Canada. And there's a, a product called Remote Check Deposit, if any of you have them in your offices, which is non-existent in Canada. And that is, um, it's a scanner that companies can now plug into, um, you know, the, the USB port of their laptop or their, um, of, or their computer, and they can scan checks and deposit them right from their desktop. 
So you know, in the in the states, it's it's much less common for folks to actually physically move to a branch on a day-to-day -day basis, where that's that's still very very common um, in the in the Canadian marketplace. Um, the other thing about lockbox with Canadian companies, um, I don't know if I don't know why it doesn't get better with technology, but mail between the United States and Canada just stinks. I don't know why. I mean. I, if I send something to Fort Erie, I think I, you know, weeks. yeah, <laughs> it's weeks, right? Well, put a, you know, customer's check in that envelope and send it over the border. You know, why wait for your, why wait for your collections? Because mail in the U.S., really, you know, a day or two when it gets from one end of the country to another. So using a lockbox really speeds receivables for, um, for folks. So when you're, you know, you're talking to clients, um, uh, the use of a lockbox also, as I understand it, um, although a Canadian company may be um, just exporting, um, does not have a, a U.S. entity, does not, you know, is, is operating as a, as a Canadian entity just exporting into the U.S. Um, the use of a U.S. lockbox with that, the company's name on it does not, um, does not generate taxation issues, just collecting the money and then bringing it back to Canada. Um, does not does not uh, mean that they're they have a presence uh, in the U.S. I'll defer to my my, um, my tax folks because I am not a ta I'm not a um, not driven in that area. Um, the other thing that is is uncommon in the U.S. that is very common with ca uh, Canadian companies are what we call overdraft facilities. We're we're very accustomed to them individually. You overdraw your checking account, and you have an overdraft facility which automatically funds your checking account so that you don't overdraw it. You know, the bank makes you a short-term loan until you deposit money, and then you know you bring your your checking account to a positive. Um, that's the way corporate lending works in Canada. So Canadian companies write their checks. Um, they overdraw their account and their, their uh, line of credit automatically funds uh, their checking account to be able to, um, to pay those items. In the U.S., that really doesn't exist with, with U.S. Um, companies. I mean, it sounds like a very simple item, right? Like it should, it should. But in the U.S., uh, with a corporate client, they still have to either call or fax or send in some uh, positive... Uh, request to borrow on a on a day to day basis, so um, you know we force our clients to to um, really look more uh, closely at their at their borrowings. It doesn't happen on an automated basis. Um, let me see. Joe asked me to. So can I, can I make a comment? Sure. I just wanted to say to your first point mm -hmm. about the deposit time. Yeah. Again, with the economy being so bad the past few years. If you do have a Canadian bank account, oftentimes if you make a deposit, those funds are being held for up to 15 days that you can't even use. So a U.S. Funds. check into that, so they're yeah. they're yeah. protecting so, themselves. Exactly. But what they're recommending is open a U.S. bank account in your domicile community and then transfer the funds so that they come to the Canadian side if you need that Canadian operating U.S. entity on the Canadian side rather than depositing so the funds aren't being held. Mm -hmm. But again, the economy is driving some of the way the processes are being done now. Yeah. Um, bank accounts can be open for Canadian companies with or without um, a tax ID number. So they don't need to um, be established in the U.S. Um, we have, you know, of the 13, 1,400 clients that, uh, we, that I hold in our portfolio, uh, you know, I bet two thirds are are Canadian entities. They are, they do not have a U.S. corporate entity of any kind. Um, they use the bank uh, really to collect deposits or or payroll. Um, they use they use it for movement of money, but they really um, you know they are Canadian entities that are exporting to the United States. Um, I think I you know I think that's it. I, you know we're we're blessed in this area. We have. Um, along the border. We have um, lots of bankers that have 
um, long histories of, of um, being able to consult with Canadian companies and know the day-to-day -day differences. I mean, it's really in knowing the differences and when you can really consult well um, with your uh, with your Canadian clients. Um, so the, you know, there's lots of folks uh, like us at HSBC that have been here for a long time. Um, so I guess you know, think about bringing oftentimes a banker into the loop early so that. Uh, companies can make good tax decisions um, and make sure that they're setting them, themselves up um, appropriately up front for uh, their U.S. business and be able to collect collect funds quickly and pay slow, right? That's good treasury management, right? <laughs> borrow, borrow money is string, string out your payables. But speaking of borrowing money, can Canadian companies um, get financing through your bank? And what are they facing and what challenges? Okay, so... Uh, borrowing money is the is the crux that changes uh, when you when a Canadian company needs to have some sort of a presence in the United States. So you can have accounts, you can have cash management, you can have a view on your accounts. You can um, you can do a lot with us as a Canadian company. Once you want to borrow money, then you have to establish a U.S. presence. Um, that's when you have to organize yourself I, I, as some uh, form of a corporate entity. Um, one of the things that's kind of um, neat about um, HSBC, if you, if you do do business with us on both <coughs> sides of the border, um, we're able to do cross-border borrowing bases. So you can look at your receivables and inventory on both sides of the border, bring those in, and you can use uh, the, the uh, capital that you have available on either side of the border. You can, you know, use it where you need it, if you will. So, but you do have to establish a U.S. entity to be okay. a borrower with a U.S. bank. Do you have Canadian bank accounts now? I had heard a rumor that HSBC was reintroducing Canadian bank accounts. It, you know, years ago they did, and we have not. I, I don't, I mean, Tyler, you might know better than I. I don't think, I haven't heard Hyder. I think most of those have been. <laughs> Could you just repeat the question and what he said? Sure. Uh, the question was, uh, is HSBC in the U.S. considering reestablishing opening Canadian dollar checking accounts? Um, there were a number of banks along the border that had those at one point in time where you could deposit funds, you could hold them in Canadian. Um, you, you know, he had limited uh, ability to use the money, um, but not use the money, but to limit its ser services associated with those accounts, but it was available. I think most banks have found that um, maybe the, the administration of those accounts wasn't worth the, the, the value to the bank, and I think most have gone away. We're not offering those now. Now, some Canadians pay me, and they just write on their check U.S. dollars, and everything is automatically transferred to U.S. dollars. Can we do that when we're paying bills in Canada? Can you just write Canadian can, can, dollars? Canadian dollars on no. It? No? You cannot. And the other thing. What's going yeah, this on is, with that? This is, yeah. the interest, this is an interesting phenomenon in Canada, you know, knowing the differences. Post-dated checks um, are common in Canada. The, the Canadians are nodding. Yeah, yeah. Well, there is no provision for post-dated checks in the United States, right? If you give me a check and it's dated February 4th, I deposit it. It's going in, right? It's gonna, it's gonna process. We don't. There, there's no provision for that in the in the U.S. system. So, um, yeah. I mean, it, it, knowing the differences, right? Because I've had people overdraw their account, and they said, "Yeah, that check wasn't supposed to be deposited or cleared." And you know, why did your bank clear clear the check? Clear, it, you know, we we deposit them, uh, and they clear on the day that they're presented to the bank. There's no provision in in U.S. banking law for post dated checks. Um, just a, a question: Do you do a full range of international banking services, like forward contracts and letters of credit, letters of guarantee, credit card services, all of those things? Absolutely. Um, foreign exchange is probably the the most common product used by the uh, you know, Canadian our cross border clients, and a lot of it just has to do with timing, right? When you want to bring back funds, and uh, when when our Canadian entities want to bring back funds to the Canadian entity. Um, timing of it, um, you know, um, ensuring that uh, you know they're not taking a hit in one one 
way, shape, or form or another. We, you know, Canadians used to say, well, you know, I'll play, I'll just play it, right? I know I won't hedge. I think we're seeing those days go. The movement has been so striking um, over the last few years. I mean, it seems to have settled a little bit within, within, within a few per percentage points. But come to hit, the competition among companies is so strong now, you know, two or three percent is a lot to give up on a sale or in taking profit. I mean, you know, uh, we're seeing our clients hedge much more strongly than they have previously. Um, our Canadian clients have the choice. They can either work with our foreign exchange department in Toronto or they can work with our folks here in New York. Um, they consult with us quite often um, about setting up strategies, so it's very, very common. Um, uh, another product which is very common we're seeing companies use is um, purchasing cards and corporate cards. Um, credit cards in, in, in the Canadian context settle in Canadian dollars, so as uh, Canadian companies are doing business here in the States, they like to keep all of their payables um, uh, in, in U.S. currency. Uh, so that they don't have the exchange issue uh, um, at the end of the month when they're forced to, right? So keeping all of those uh, all of those items in U.S. dollars is is important to them. Um, so you know our basic Canadian client will generally have um, will have a checking account, will have web access with um, with accounts on both sides of the border or whatever country they do business in on one platform. They'll have credit cards, and they'll have a line of credit. Can I just ask one of the, do you do sure. credit reports internationally? Do we do credit reports for our clients? Yes. No, but Marianne Stein, who is here, <laughs> <laughs> would be happy to help you with that. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Sure. Could you just go over, like, really, like you're explaining it to a third grader. I mean, everybody here is really smart, but the whole lockbox thing. That just, sure. Like, somebody comes down here and, and how, it's an how does that work for them? It's yeah. an interesting product because, I mean, if, it, um, if you've ever been, if you, has anybody ever visited a lockbox site? It's so manual. It's unbelievable. I mean, it's, a, it's like outsourcing your receivables. Um, so um, instead of um, billing your clients and putting your address, your cor corporate address, on the invoice that they would return with the check, the bank will give you a P.O. box um, that they would return the item to. So the, your client um, you know, writes out a check to ABC Company and they send it to the lockbox. Um, you know, we have four lockbox sites uh, across the United States that can be used. Those items go to the lockbox and the bank clears out that lockbox because mail in the United States is, is uh, at the central post office is delivered 24 hours a day. We go every six hours, clear out the items, take them back to the bank, image everything, the envelope, the check, the, uh, any details, um, uh, payment details that are within the envelope. That, uh, those items are imaged, that, that information is sent back to the client. Uh, it's usually received within 20 minutes. But the most important part is the check is deposited, and no one from your company has had to touch the item. Um, it usually it speeds uh, collections from Canada um, really by at least seven days. Um, in the United States, because the items are, are being processed at, uh, at the central post office as opposed to getting to, uh, to, your, to your site, it speeds it by at least a day or two. So. Um, it's, it's really, it's a nice feature. I mean, we have, um, you know, uh, we'll talk to clients about how they're taking their U.S. receivables. And some will say, well, I have a P.O. box, you know, in Niagara Falls. And, you know, I, I go down once every two weeks and clear it out. And then I take it up and I deposit them into my U.S. account. And, you know, there's a lot of, you know, you, you're paying for a P.O. box. That, that money could be, you know, used could be redirected to paying for a, um, a lockbox. Really, the cost of a lockbox in the scheme is, very, is pretty inexpensive. It's $100 a month. And if you think about the amount of time it takes you to drive down, take a, the, out the, the, the items, process the, uh, the, um, the deposits yourself, you know, it's, it's really a small price to pay. I mean, it's a very manual, manual process depositing a check. Um, 
and we have many, many Canadian clients that, that take, prop, that take uh, a part in that service. So I'll open the floor uh, for questions. Okay, the, the question it relates to state taxes and provincial taxes, whereas the, when Brent and I were talking, we were really just talking about the federal side of things. Uh, on the state side of things, what sort of guidance is there for a Canadian company going down to the U.S.? Uh, the short answer is there's no, there's no quick, easy reference because every state is different. That's really the, the, the main caveat that you have to have whenever you're de dealing with uh, SALT state and local tax. Um, you, can ha you have some general concepts that tend to be true across states, but there's so many different state taxation systems and so many different variations thereon that it's very difficult to distill down into any sort of general advice. There's really no good substitute for talking to, to a client or potential client about the specific states that they're involved in and the specific activities and, um, and to provide guidance on that basis. Uh, there, there are guides available and we certainly have guides uh, which are multi-state tax guides and provide a good starting point and some quick answers if you're looking for some general indications such as if I if I set up if I'm a Canadian company and I set up a warehouse in New York State just as a fulfillment center, will that give me nexus, i.e., a, a, a tax presence at the state level? Um, and it turns out under New York law there is an exception for, for for nexus for that sort of activity, but in most other states there is no such exception. Um, though those guides are helpful, but most of those guides tend to be based on. Um, um, informal research sources, surveys, and whatnot, and they don't necessarily carry carry full weight. Uh, but yeah, the the short answer is that any any state guidance would really need to be provided on a client by client basis. As far as uh, provincial tax guidance, uh, the good news about dealing with the provinces in Canada relative to the states in the U.S. is that there's a far far greater sense of integration. Uh, in the U.S., the states are I wouldn't say have completely free reign, but they have an awful lot of latitude to create their own taxation systems, their own rules. Uh, it really just has to do with how the governments were established in the U.S. and Canada, um, U.S. being a, a, a federation of states that all came together, whereas in Canada it's more like here's the federal government and let's just make some sub subdivisions for provinces. So, so um, as far as provincial taxation, it's usually not a huge deal in Canada because provinces it, in al almost all respects follow federal taxation rules. There are some wrinkles in terms of credits that are available in certain provinces but not in others. But um, one, one good example for anyone who's um, familiar in general with um, state taxation versus, um, versus provincial taxation in Canada is how, uh, how do you divide up the pie between the provinces uh, as far as allocating income. In the U.S., every state has, has it up to themselves to decide um, how are we going to apportion income to the state. Is it based on property? Is it based on revenue? How is it weighted? So Such a myriad of different ways of doing it. In Canada, there's just one simple schedule on your Canadian tax return. The provincial, uh, the, the income is allocated just based on salaries and revenue. One one uniform schedule, you, you fill it out and you're, you're done with. There's no, uh, or I wouldn't say no, there's very little uncertainty as to how it's done. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, yeah, uh, provincial tax guidance is usually not a huge deal. It might come up more in a sales tax context. Um, and again, you, you'd have some, some general provincial guidance that you could give, but if you're getting down to the specifics, there's no substitute to looking at the specific situation and what provinces you're involved in, what activities you're contemplating doing. So hopefully that answers your question. Maybe a little more than you wanted, but. <laughs> uh, any, any other questions for myself or for Brent or any of the other? Yeah, you know, clients will ask me, well, what kind of business, I know you touched on it a bit, what kind of business structure should I, you know, <laughs> set up in the, United, in the US? Mm -hmm. um, often it's a choice between just operating as a branch of the mm -hmm. Canadian company or setting up a, a separate subsidiary. And what I usually say is, go back and ask your accountant. Yep. So what are the considerations that go into play? Okay, so, so what are the considerations when deciding how to 
uh, as a Canadian company to invest down in the U.S.? Do I set up a separate subsidiary? Do I just operate as a branch? If I'm going to set up a subsidiary, what type of company do I set up? Well, there's no, there's no simple answer for that question. It really depends on the nature of the business, what you're trying to accomplish, um, and what's most tax efficient in your situation. Uh, one, one general guideline that's probably true more often than not is that y usually you don't get to the point of actually setting up a U.S. corporation until you have a taxable presence for federal purposes. And I say for federal purposes because usually you'll have taxable presence for state purposes earlier than you do for federal. Um, because of the tax treaty between U.S. and Canada, there's, there's a much higher threshold of taxability. The, the concept of a permanent establishment in the U.S. Is, uh, is a, it's a fairly high bar, and it's also something that's reasonably easy to plan around. And you're only dealing with one entity here. You're dealing with uh, the federal government, whereas state taxation, every state is different. You may be taxable in state A, but not in state B. Um, once you're, you're taxable federally in the U.S. Is, is typically at that point when you start looking at setting up an actual entity, a uh, subsidiary. In a lot of cases, keeping it simple is the best. Just setting up uh, a regular old C corporation, fully taxable in the U.S., is the way to go. Um, occasionally, you might look at some more um, some more advanced options. Uh, I, I'm more of an individual tax practitioner. I, I know enough about the corporate tax to be a little bit dangerous, but I am a, a few years removed from that. Uh, it's there's a lot of different considerations, but usually, as long as you don't have permanent establishment in the U.S., it's okay to muddle along with your Canadian company doing business, uh, at least from a tax perspective. We, we do find a lot of clients who say, well, never mind the tax considerations. I'm getting some flack from my customers. They're insisting that uh, they want to do business with a U.S. entity because they don't want to have to deal, in most cases, with foreign withholding. They don't want to make their lives more complicated. They, they just want to keep it simple. And if it's a big enough client, then that, that could be what pushes someone over the top to saying, okay, now I need to set up a company. I can't go on any longer. It's just a Canadian company dabbling in the U.S., for lack of a better word. Um, another thing that might come up is, is uh, legal liability. Um, the U.S. is a more litigious society than Canada, and the risk of lawsuit is, in general, higher. And... Uh, rather than put the Canadian company at risk of a large lawsuit in the U.S., that would compel them to set up uh, a U.S. entity to provide some level of shielding. Question: uh, The question is, if you're going to set up a, a U.S. a U.S. company as a Canadian business doing business mm -hmm. in the U.S., does it make sense to set up that new company as a subsidiary of the Canadian operating company, or does it make it does it more, make more sense to set it up as a, a sister company, mm -hmm. as we'd call it, where? It's, um, it, it's under common ownership with the Canadian operating company, but uh, just in, in parallel rather than a, a, a vertical arrangement. Uh, what, what we see often is there's, a, there's a, a disincentive in many cases to have it as a direct subsidiary. Uh, the reason being that that could uh, quote unquote taint the Canadian company as far as its status in Canada. Um, and the ability of the owners of that Canadian company to, shit, to, to sell their shares of the Canadian company and avail themselves of certain tax benefits. There's a, there's a $750,000 capital gains exemption for Canadian individuals selling shares of a Canadian-controlled private company. Now, one of the conditions is that, that uh, the rules get quite complicated, but suffice it to say, if that Canadian company or subsidiaries under it have a certain amount of foreign activities, then that could throw the, com the whole company offside such that the owner won't be able to avail themselves of that 750000 exemption when they sell the shares. Um, as a way to combat that, if you set up the U.S. company as a sister company to the, uh, the, to the Canadian operating company, then it, it's not going to taint the ownership, taint the, uh, the, the, the activities, the Canadianness of the activities of the Canadian operating company. That, that's one example of consideration, but there, there are no doubt myriad other ones. Uh, I, I do quite often, though, see people leaning more towards a sister company than a direct vertical arrangement in situations where that, those particular types of tax benefits are in question. Sometimes it's not an issue, but often it is. 
Okay, the, the, the point that was made is that uh, the direct vertical uh, ownership, the Canadian company owning a U.S. company might create estate tax issues for the, the, the Canadian company or its owners. Uh, that's usually not a, a large concern just because having that Canadian company in between uh, should generally be a pretty effective shield against the estate tax. Uh, another situation in which that could come up is a Canadian owns uh, a Canadian holding company which in turn holds U.S. real estate. That, that's also generally speaking a, a pretty effective shield against estate tax. Um, in in some, some forms of ownership the degree of protection may be a little bit uh, dubious but when we're talking about uh, a standard run of mill Canadian corporation that should provide shielding to the the owner above. Okay, uh, the question is if you're considering a, more of a joint venture or partnership uh, type of entity when investing down into the US, is, is that something that we would generally handle or would we need to pass that off to others? Uh, my, myself personally I would pass it on to others within within our group since my focus is really on taxation of individuals but we have uh, people within our firm, within both our U.S. tax group and what we'd call the international tax group, which is uh, really deals with Canada and any other country. Uh, they, they certainly do assist in all types of structuring, including the, the joint venture or partnership types of uh, types of entities. That's um, uh, uh, partnership entities are quite often considered just because. They are a, a flow-through entity for both U.S. and Canadian tax purposes. There are certain entities, as we mentioned earlier in the presentation, such as LLCs, where the treatment on both sides of the border is inconsistent. But if we're talking just a regular old partnership, a limited partnership, both Canada and U.S. will treat that in generally the same way. So you're not going to, um, in most cases, run the risk of things like double tax arising in those sorts of structures. Okay, the, the, the question is whether we would also provide um, advice with respect to enterprise zones, special trade zones, regional areas in the U.S. that offers uh, special tax incentives. Uh, that's, that's something where um, we, we can handle that to some degree out of our group in Canada. If it requires a special, special localized expertise, we, we do have a strong affiliate firm in the U.S. and actually we have um, Ke Kevin in the audience happens to be from one of our U.S. affiliate firms. Kevin waves. <laughs> um, when we when we come up t with um, U.S. local issues, whether they're they're state tax, uh, 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 sales and use tax, things of that nature, where local expertise is really needed, uh, BDO has a strong network throughout the U.S. Uh, a series of uh, member firms and also affiliate firms that we have at our disposal and we're, we have a strong relationship with them, we can get those sorts of answers that we need. Speaking, speaking of waving, before we end, could the immigration lawyers raise their hands? Okay, the reason I'm saying that is because tonight we've talked about tax stuff and financial consequences of, of uh, immigrating people and visas. It works the other way too. There are a lot of immigration consequences. There's immigration consequences to expatriating yourself. Uh, filing a 1040 NR instead of a 1040 could make the difference in whether or not your client's green card gets lifted to the border and whether you can get it back for them. So I would urge the um, accountant and tax lawyer attendees to choose your favorite immigration lawyer and ask, ask any question you've got. So this will conclude the formal part of our presentation. Uh, feel free to mingle, ask, ask questions informally, and thank you everybody. Thank you.